Today's guest on the interview is Lord Weidenfeld. Born in Austria in 1919, fled from the Nazis, became a British citizen in 1946, founded his own publishing company, Weidenfeld and Nicholson, became political advisor to Israel's first president, knighted in 1969, honored with a life peerage in 1976. And in 2011, he was appointed Knight Grand Cross of the Order of the British Empire. Lord Weidenfeld, I'd just like to say what a privilege it is and an honour to be here in your London home on the embankment of the Thames and to meet such a man as yourself. Our Revelation viewers will absolutely love you because I saw you on Hard Talk uh, when I was on vacation a few weeks ago and uh, the way that you came across with such a lovely spirit, if I may say, and a heart, uh, and particularly a heart, I would say, for righteousness and justice. Well, you're very, very generous. <laughs> I thought that, that my experience was a very good one. I thought he wasn't too hard on me. He wasn't, was he? I think he had a lot of respect, and, and yeah. quite rightly so. I'd love for our viewers to... This is going to be a little bit of a different interview than you've done before, because what our viewers like to see is the heart of a person, not just all the achievements, which you've got many, uh, and uh, in your long life of 95 years of age now. Amazing. Born in 1919? 1919, yes. I'll be, be soon 96 years. Oh, amazing. I make me feel like a, a spring chicken here <laughs> at nearly 70. But yes. some of the things that our viewers would love to, to start with is knowing a little bit about the person, Lord Weidenfeld. Go back to you at the time uh, when you were a young boy. Well, I was brought up in Austria after the First World War and a very unhappy period because the country had shrunk from being a multi-powered, uh, multi-layered uh, monarchy to a small rump state. And of course you felt also insecurity, political insecurity, instability and anti-Semitism as a predominant uh, 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 feature. It was a different kind of anti-Semitism as you had under Hitler. If you might compare Hitler to jackboots, he would compare that particular anti-Semitism that I experienced. It was more like sort of rubber, rubber sole shoes, you see. But it was strong, it was pervasive. And so I grew up already then in an atmosphere where anti-Semitism played an important part. And after going through a period of sort of flirting with young social democratic movements and so on, because young Jews had nowhere else to go, because the official parties were rather anti-Semitic parties. So I was then taken by a distant relation to a meeting uh, in the concert hall in Vienna when I was, I think, 14 or 15, and um, heard Jabotinsky, the leader of the revisionist Zionist party, the predecessor of the present Likud party you know, in, in Israel. And he was there dressed in a khaki shirt and in, in boots and uh, military trousers. And a heckler said, why are you wearing the brown shirt of the Nazis? And he said, this is not the brown shirt of the Nazi. This is the brown shirt of the, de of the desert, the khaki shirt fighting against the Turks in the First World War for a Palestinian state of the Jews. And then he said, Hitler's come and go. The German people is eternal. That made a tremendous effect on me. I saw that all these young boys who were frightened because there were hundreds of Nazis outside the, the hall shouting pig Jews and Jews and this and the other. They stiffened their necks and their, and their shoulders and marched through the, the, the new idea that was the beginning of Zionism. And so I was a Zionist all my life. Help us to picture uh, uh, a little bit more about Jabotinsky. Well, Jabotinsky was uh, a, a person who um, uh, was immediately uh, bold enough to say, we want a Jewish state. Uh, the Zionist movement in those days was very much more modest in its uh, uh, approach and very much tied to the Brit apron strings of the British colonial office and would have been satisfied with some sort of status, which the Balfour Declaration gave them of a rather ambiguous situation. And of course, the, the ambiguity 
was expressed by the colonial office and the British Foreign Office against the Israels, against the Jews in for the Arabs when the Jews inside Palestine had a bad time and there was the Arab revolt against the Jews during in the, in the 1930s and, and the white paper which prevented Jewish immigration. And it was then the Zionist movement became uh, much more militant and with the help of America, may I say, uh, then got itself uh, a situation where it became a more, it be, became a more powerful movement and it led eventually to the United Nations Resolution in 47, dividing Palestine into the Arab and the Jewish state. You see, for a young Jewish, young Jewish boy, with certain, we all had a sort of political uh, feeling, it was a highly politicized, feverish atmosphere. I called, it, I called it in my own book, The Age of the Buttonhole, because you looked when you walked past uh, a, a person, not at his or her face, but where was he or she wearing a swastika in the body hole, or a hammer and zickle of the communist, or three arrows of the socialist. In other words, it's a highly politicized atmosphere. And so, um, obviously, uh, the, the was early stimulated by the fact that there was anti-Semitism into professing color, and I became Zionist very early in my life. And, uh, something I that also, was... I fought a student duel against the Nazi, the last one to be fought, I think, before the Hitler came to power. How did you do that? What was the background to that? Well, the background is this was very, today difficult to think. In the universities, the student, uh, student corps uh, were quite import, played an important part. Uh, they were sort of fraternities, etc. And they were divided into Catholic ones, into Nazi ones, and into sort of free liberal ones, and also Jewish ones. And all the others, or most of them, clubbed together in the city of Beethoven and declared that Jews were no gentlemen and were, were not eligible to be given satisfaction at the duel. So I. The, the routine we had, in, uh, I belonged to a to Zionist student corporation, and we decided to fight the enemy with, with his own weapons. We, 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 we learned how to fence saber, and we then provoked them and made them with some difficulty to accept we, we fought duels with Nazis. And I went, I went to England, and my father was in prison until June 39, th uh, and with the help of a wonderful family of Plymouth brethren who had taken me on as like a child. And I spent a year working, uh, of continuing my studies at King's College London, but I was staying like a child, treated extremely well by this Christian sect. And uh, they even helped my parents to come out because my, when my father was left, left prison, that was advised to leave quickly because they would put him into a concentration camp and there's no way out. So they came with me to the home office and guaranteed that they would look after the, my parents. They saved my parents' life. That's one of the motivations why I uh, felt that for once the Jew is the elder brother of the church and we should do something also for the Christians as the Christians have done something for us. And of course, my great privilege of knowing and being close to Pope John Paul II, which is another story, and being part of this Castel Gandolfo group, which met every summer under his roof in the, in the country. Uh, I had made contacts in the Vatican and also found tremendous help and solace from this marvelous man who not only coined the famous phrase, the Jew is the elder brother of the church, but told me one day, and as I say, I've been to about 12 or 13 annual meetings with Christians and Jews and talking to the Pope for a whole weekend. And one day he took me aside and said, you know, when I was a young priest in Krakow during the war, in my waking hours, I could hear the moaning in the, of the Auschwitz prisoners 15 or 20 kilometers away. And then he coined this phrase, which he then made public. You know, we are very close to each other. 
you were the elder brother of the church. And this stuck in my memory. This combination between this wonderful Pope saying these things to me and my wonderful experience of being the ghost the guest of a evangelical family. Not the richest, but very wonderful people. No attempt at proselytizing, treating me like a child. I said, I've got to repay this. And this is the beginning of the Operation Safe Haven. I see there's a letter over there from Benjamin Netanyahu. Yes. What sort of gentleman is he? Well, I am very fond of him. I know him quite well. But he is a person who has a, a passion for Israel's security. I think he's been through all kinds of manifestations and the changes in his own life. He's, as I said, there's two other people in his life, his family. He had to live up to or, or felt that they looked down on him. His brother, the hero of Entebbe, who saved the people, remember, in the Entebbe raid. And his father was a great historian and who was a very passionate Zionist. And so he had something to live up to. I believe that Tatiana Nathaniel is a, is a very good man. And when it comes to serious decisions, for instance, if you were to come to another uh, intifada, or thanks to uh, Iran having now got so much cash now, uh, some sort of attack by Hezbollah in, in, on, on the whole Golden Heights, he'll hit out and he'll clobber them again. In 1999, I had the privilege of meeting uh, Netanyahu, and it was something that he said to me that set me on a path uh, to make sure that Revelation TV does what he'd actually said to me that very night. It was only a short interview, just a few minutes. But he really said to me when I said, what can we do as Christians to help Israel? And he said to establish the truth and to counter the lies. That, and always when there are lies associated with anything that usually ends up coming back to the sort of situation that happened time and time again with the pogroms, with the, the, what happened in Germany as well, with the Holocaust, it's always undergirded by um, misinformation about the Jewish people. And I, from a child, had come to the conclusion that something wasn't right. I was born in 1946 and I saw a lot of documentaries on television and I could not understand why and how a generation, like say my mum and dad, didn't do anything about it. And so what lessons could you say to our viewers that could be learned from such anti-Semitic rhetoric and also the, the things which led to such things as the Holocaust? Well, I think this is very interesting to say. Um, I believe what we are now experiencing with ISIL, ISIL, the barbarian practices of this particular regime there, is so much the worst. That the jihadism is so much more cruel and barbaric than anything experienced before. I go so far as to say that of the three manifestations of deep, it's more than anti-Semitism, of deep destructiveness, destructive thinking about the Jews. In Dante's Inferno, the jihadist is at the bottom rung. He's worse than the Holocaust. He's worse than the Gulag. He is, he's reached a particular stage of barbarism never before. But these people, those barbarians, they love it. They take the genitals off, they take the eyes out, they crucifix you, and they get pleasure out of it. Therefore, I think they are the lowest form of mankind. And I say this with considerable, considerable uh, uh, conviction. There has never been such a people like the ISIL people and by such barbarians. Because to enjoy it at the same time, that is the lowest, this is the lowest rung of the of Dante's Inferno. When you look at the situation across the world now where with ISIS, we really need uh, the wisdom of a Daniel or a Joseph, 
and looking at biblical examples of great men of leadership, what would you say if you were in leadership with all the years and, and experience that you have, uh, with all due respect, even at the age of 95, you, you, you've got all your marbles there, what would you say to a, a world about how to get to the problem of dealing with ISIS? What is, in your view, uh, the answer? I have to say something which it's not easy to say that even in your program, because it's sort of kind of uh, attacking the head of state of a friendly nation, the United States. I think Osama is a disaster. I agree with you. He has done something so unpardonable, partly out of ignorance and lack of intelligence as far as foreign affairs is concerned. He may be a good orator, he may be good at getting, catching votes inside the United States and internal politics. I don't know enough about it to judge him how good he is on health or on education. But when it comes to foreign affairs, there have never been any better be so, oh, should I put it, totally useless and counterproductive. He built up Putin into a sort of Bismarck in the Middle East, made him the, the sort of, kind of arbiter in Syria and in Iran, and got, got, he left his allies in, in the lurch, showing America as being completely weak and undefending is a terrible, terrible tragedy. Our views would be, um, are very concerned about the situation, especially with regards to Israel's security. And Netanyahu, the way that he was treated in the, the recent um, meeting there of the United Nations, where there was the total silence for 45 seconds, it was remarkable, and spoke volumes, if, if, ironically, but what would you say to our viewers that <coughs> have such a heart and interest for the security of Israel? Where, where do you see Israel in the coming ten, next 10 years to 15 years? How we do need people like Netanyahu, who I believe is a strong character as well. But with your wisdom, what do you see the future for Israel? Well, this is a very interesting point. Um, there are so many various the deal with Iran, in my view, is catastrophic from the point of view, not that they are not going to get the bomb, they're not going to get the bomb for 20 years. But they're now flush with money, that they're going to finance Hamas and Hezbollah, and they're going to start some form of intifada on, 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 the, on, the, on the Golden Heights. Because that the regime, it is ludicrous and childish to think that suddenly overnight they're going to become a democratic country because they are more sophisticated than others, so what? In fact, the new man, the president, has more uh, amputations and uh, stoning and death warrants, uh, torture than his predecessors. All he has is better table manners and better suits. And the fact that they would give up their power, the, their theocratic government, they would not give up the power. And what they will do is to give money to Hamas and Hezbollah. And they're going to have another intifada within a matter of weeks or months. Yeah, that's the likelihood. So in other words, that was not a very smart move. But in any case, whatever happens, Israel needs a strong hand. And I do therefore believe that Netanyahu is the right man. Personally, I would love to see a coalition government as it happened in the Six-Day War, a Herzog and a Sipi Livni as part of a, a Netanyahu government or a government of the right, because the right is in these principles and the, the, the left and the center would be useful too in, his, in Israeli terms. So in other words, I believe that uh, of Obama by not showing any interest or aptitude to get his boots on the ground and so simply stamping his, in the Oval Office and shaking his fist and saying he's going to do this and that and moving from one red line to another and antagonizing our allies, I think is a disaster. So, because our viewers, um, from a biblical point of view, 
know that uh, according to scripture, ancient scriptures like in the Hebrew scriptures in Zechariah that many nations as prophesied that would come against Jerusalem so that there would be a, a lack of support from the West and other nations in the world for Israel in their time of trouble. And uh, I'm not saying that you're necessarily into prophecy, um, but it is something which our viewers are concerned about and need to know how to pray really for Israel to come out of all of the, the, the I suppose the danger that it looks like it's facing. So again, just a word of encouragement for our viewers from a, a man like yourself would uh, go a long way. Well, we should all try that having these wonderful friends like you and uh, particularly religious uh, block, as it were, uh, I mean, Catholicism and Christianity should realize that jihadism is the worst enemy they, they've had. And not just us, they also destroy you too. And so I think we should stick together and again uh, behold what Pope John Paul said, that the Jew is the elder brother of the church and you are our brothers and sisters. We should work together and fight against jihadism as the worst enemy we've ever had, both of us. Talking of Christian communities in the Middle East, which uh, are, 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 I suppose, at most risk, uh, and I know that you've you spoke on the hard talk about this uh, how your concern is to to help them because of uh, the past um, your particular personal past uh, w being brought out of a, a bad situation yourself as a young person and taken uh, in by a christian family is that something that you uh, can do and i remember on the the, the interview that hard talk, stephen did on hard talk with you is that he pushed you he said why don't you do the same for the muslims this is a very good question because a Muslim threatened by ISIL has got both the financial support of people like the Emirates or so on, they're absolutely swimming in money and they have the advantage of logistics. If today a Muslim were uh, ed uh, persecuted in ISIL country in a taxi at 100 kilometers away, he's in a safe haven. The Christian hasn't got the money available there. He has to go around the world to, if he's lucky enough to get anywhere. So the comparison is totally, totally irrelevant. As a man of influence, do you think that the erosion of Christian or Judeo-Christian values that have occurred over the, the last generation in particular, that you could have any sway with politicians and people in high places? All we can do is to show that we have certain interest in common, that we are threatened by the same people, the jihadism, even if the last Jew goes out of Europe, he has a home to go to Israel, but the last Gentile has not. In other words, if your children and grandchildren are going to wake up and see that there are, not, there are six, seven, eight million Muslims, and that they're all sympathizing with the extremists, then I don't envy you. I, we have at least, however, painful it may be in the short run, the chance of going back to, to Israel. In other words, in other, the worst that's going to happen to a French Jewish family, all right, that is not going to live in Paris, but live in Tel Aviv, and go, go to theatre and opera and, 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 and lead a decent life. But I mean, the, the, the poor Christian hasn't got it. And that's why I think it's so terribly important that we should work together and see that we have a common enemy. We can see in the news on a daily basis now how uh, many that are fleeing uh, from Syria particularly um, are predominantly Muslim um, and we see very little help going towards the Syrian Christians. It's the trouble that you see, and I, I mean particularly left-wing parties and so on, uh, who don't recognize this distinction or this danger. They were so, in fact, that they haven't got the faith of the, of the solidarity of being Christians. And I think this is a very, very serious thing. I mean, I, I can, as I said before, I don't want to repeat myself, the great difference if one say, why Christians are not Muslims? Of course I want to help the Muslims under ISIS, but they can help themselves so much easily. Look, the money in the Emirates, 
the money they've got. I mean, well, and, the, and did I say, there's a lot of logistic problem. If you're called Hassan something and they threaten to, get, to take your balls off, I mean, you take a taxi and then 100 kilometers, you go into an aviator day and they, in theory, should give you food and drink and, and, and a job and you're okay. But the Christian can't get it. This might, I'm going to be making this quite short now because obviously we've kept you long enough. But one of the things that uh, I see, that m myself included and some of our viewers, that we could see that as, as a Christian minority, which we're becoming in, uh, in the United Kingdom, that uh, there are persecutions coming in different ways, faith groups, uh, faith schools, faith organizations, Christian organizations, uh, we feel are being targeted. And it, it's sort of reminiscent of what happened in the 30s, you know, in Germany, that, but we don't have a homeland to go to. What would you say to encourage us just to, to include this interview so that we can um, take some comfort in a, a wise man's words? Well, I think you should realize that jihadism is the worst enemy Christianity has ever had. Leave aside the anti-Semitism of the Jews or Israel, because we have somewhere to go. And uh, if uh, there are going to be six, seven, or eight million Muslims, all jihadists, all passionate France, I'm sorry for the French. I mean, we, w w whatever anti-Semitism is happening now, it is very, very unpleasant. But we have a lifeline we can go, go and live in Israel. That's why I think it's so very important that Israel has kept, kept going. And we, when I say we, I mean some of us, uh, say we want to help our Christian friends and brothers and sisters. We don't want to, but we don't want to get in Israel involved. It's a very important point. You, our operation excludes Israel. Why? Because we don't want to give the Arabs the ammunition to say, you're against the law of return, you don't want any Arabs back. Uh, why should why, why take, do you take down this Christian Arabs back? It's a discrimination. So we keep Israel out of this picture. But there's all, the whole world they can go to. And of course, I hope one day they can go back and restore uh, free Christian communities in, in, in the Middle East. We don't want to depopulate the Middle East of Christians. We just want to help them to get out because their lives, their dignity uh, is, is, is at stake. And they're under the duress of one of the worst people that's ever lived in this world. Well, you are the elder of the Christian church and uh, without our roots being in Judea values, uh, we would have, we'd be in a, a much more sorrier state than we are. Uh, thank you so much, Lord Wodenfeld, for being who you are and uh, giving us this opportunity to meet you today. And God bless you, may I say. Thank you very much. You've been very generous and very stimulating. Thank you so much for the interview.